So Gary, I probably should have sent my other video in response to this video. And I watched them both, and then I think <coughs> there's more in this one about the Treasury and the and the Fed. You know how they're colluding. Um, but there's also a lot in here, back to that point that I was making earlier about uh, about the fact that American business, now when I say American business, you know, American business finds itself, you know, running short on profits to the shareholders. And they figured that, you know what, we can do this overseas, you know. So they take and they borrow a bunch of money and they close down their plant, put the government, put the people on the dole, you know, put their people on the dole. They borrow a bunch of money from the banks, you know, and they say, we're going to invest overseas, we're going to either build a factory, invest in a factory, or get, you know, ironclad contracts to make sure that uh, we're going to be able to pay this money back, okay, and they do it. Now, the offshoring of jobs through capital, okay, um, I mentioned in a video to you quite a while back that, you know, I did have a background with the Community Reinvestment Act, okay, and that in Vermont, we worked very hard, you know, for years and forestalled for several years the introduction of interstate banking in Vermont. Because why? Because <coughs> up until that time, you know, banks were limited to, um, you know, having, having, being based and operating in a state. And uh, the banks were therefore forced, you know, to have the identity of the state in mind as they did their banking activities. Um, and recognizing that interstate banking, you know, that doesn't just mean, you know, that the New Hampshire people can come over uh, to Vermont and start a bank. What it really means is that, is that all the region, cent central, regional central banks are going to ha uh, take over the banks of, of, uh, of, the, of the individual states and that they are going to do it by acquisitions, mergers and acquisitions, that they're going to become so big that what will happen, Gary? What do you think we were concerned about? this, you know, too big to fail, okay, that eventually, eventually the power of the banks was going to become such that they're unmanageable, that is to say there is no regulatory structure that can actually handle them, okay, and that they're going to be really become international in nature, and by becoming international in nature, all that really matters is that the banks, and the banks control the money system, and the money system controls the economy and therefore you know the all those things that we're complaining about losing and missing you know those good old jobs you know those good old wages those good old benefits those good old pensions those good old things that seem to be pretty much okay up until the day that they told us the system was coming crashing down <clears throat> well if we didn't have interstate banking okay we didn't have international banking we didn't have interstate banking and we didn't have you know the growth of the financial services industry so that, you know, the investment banks are, are, you know, so big and so unregulated that they're creating, you know, most of the money and doing it through basically counterpartying each other's investments. If we didn't have that, you know, tremendous growth in the, in the money power that started with interstate banking, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. But we are where we are today. We are where we are today. Now... We've had a little discussion, you know, after Pete's piece on uh, the mother of all free lunches, which, by the way, to me is completely 100% valid, okay? Uh, we had a couple of discussions about, uh, about um, the money creation and the powers and the powers, uh, uh, you know, of the banks that go along with the money creation. And, this, and the benefits that go along with money creation that are, re, that are resorting to the banks, being resorting to the banks. And the fact that, that there was something wrong with that. Now, I want to relate this back to, you know, my experience and come, becoming a monetary reformer by the fact that my dad was a monetary reformer. And <clears throat> my dad, you know, kind of had a word for it, uh, uh, the thing that we're all missing here, Gary, okay? And and that uh, Gary, I'm sorry, Nick. Um, and that is, and that is, the priority use of the money supply. Okay. If the if the only priority use of the money supply is going to be to make more money, and you happen to be one of us, okay, 
then the priority use of the money supply is not to keep you employed. It's not to keep you in housing. It's not to keep you fed. It's not to keep you educated. It's not to keep you healthy. It's to make more money. Okay? So my dad said, by the government taking the power and creating the money, okay? Now, again, I, I remind you and everybody else that I'm quoting a system that Milton Friedman laid out as probably the best method for creating the nation's money when his monetary theories were honestly revolutionary, you know, revolutionary. You know, a lot of people, you know, he don't get any respect because he became a, a brilliant proponent of the free market. He was so hard to argue with uh, because he had the <laughs> shtick down well. Uh, but in his early days, you know, he proposed government creation of money. You know? Then you can have all the free markets you want because the money system would be stable. The money, the money system being stable actually really does enable free marketing, free, free enterprise. You have, you have the equal level playing field. It's mandated, okay, it's a, it's a government playing field. And since those are dollar U.S. denominated debts that they're issuing out there, we should have a level playing field with the money system, okay? But anyway, my dad's point about the priority use of the money supply was, was that, and you talked about some of the things that we need, and I just talked about some of the things that you need. We need health, and we need education, and we need... Uh, we need all those infrastructure improvements. We need to switch to green jobs, and those are those are those are national economic goals. We don't have any way to implement national economic goals. We have to turn it into some kind of a public, a private, uh, you know, partnership of of uh, of uh, where the government says, you know, please help us do this to the private people instead of actually setting goals and having policies to do it. Priority use of the money supply, my dad said. The priority use of the money supply represents the seniority benefit of creating the money. What happens when that money first goes into existence? And Gary, I think, is going to have a problem with this, but you know, the fact of the matter is that we have a somewhere between a ten and twelve trillion dollar economy. Who knows? And if we're going to grow by two percent. If the economy of this country is going to be enabled to grow by 2%, we need $200 billion of new money. It cannot grow without $200 billion of new money, okay? And, and have price stability and full employment. Okay? I mean, I'm just saying, keeping monetary objectives and economic objectives together, okay, using the, prior the, uh, the priority use of the, of the money supply, such that when the government creates $200 billion next year, it does it in the budgeting process. It says in the budgeting process what the money's going to be used for. We don't, they don't just create the money. Now that money has is, is been created, okay, it's at the end of next year. We just experienced a year where we had 2% economic growth. It went up because we had 2% increase in the money supply, okay, and because there was you know, the anticipation by the monetary authorities that that, in, that that growth was going to take place. And so what was the benefit of the government creating the money? It was whatever we agreed was going to be in the budget. You see? That's the priority use of the money supply. So right there, you've, you've totally removed the benefits that the bankers have, A, of creating $600 billion to $700 billion, and that's what they've been doing. Okay, they've been creating six or seven hundred billion, creating all these inflationary expectations that are locked up in non-mark to market toxic assets, and those toxic assets are what's poisoning the economy. So we have the ability, through monetary reform, to do the things that we know need doing, and we have a mechanism for doing them, which is through having the government create the money in the budgeting process by funding the uh, and, 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 and reducing the tax and thereby reducing the tax burden by 200 billion dollars it's just automatic it's automatic 
it's not a matter of it's not a matter of you know changing the tax structure or giving somebody a break. It's a matter of not spending.